Good morning and welcome to Online Church here at Sharon United Methodist Church. I am Gordon McCullough, one of the lay servants here at the church, and I will be leading you in worship this week as Pastor Pete and Jan are on vacation. Please take a moment to let us know if you are worshiping with us today by filling out the Connect card. Our prayer teams meet weekly to lift up the needs of our church, community, and the world. We would love to lift up your prayers as well. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today's call, call to worship will be given by Gary Vogadine. Today I'm reading from Psalm chapter 30. I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast drawn me up, and hast not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried to thee for help, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By thy favor, O Lord, thou hast established me as a strong mountain. Thou didst hide thy face. I was dismayed. To thee, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise thee? Will it tell of thy faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be thou my helper. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness, that my soul may praise thee and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to thee forever. Thus ends the reading of this word. Today's hymn will be Stand Up and Bless the Lord. pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle us in the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, by the light of the Holy Spirit, did instruct the hearts of the faithful 
Grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your consolations. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Today's scripture lesson comes, from us, comes to us from Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, have for you the, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. It's Jeremiah. The main Bible that I use, and I have several translations, is the Life Application Study Bible. The thing that I like about it is that it explains some of the verses in simple terms. Part of the commentary of the verse is this. This does not mean that we will be spared pain, suffering, or hardship, but that God will see us through to a glorious conclusion. So, allow me to fill you in on what happened nine years ago, because really, I shouldn't even be here. I believe that my story is a lot like the Apostle Paul's, in that Paul was very successful at what he was doing at the time, and so was I. I have enjoyed much success in my life for rewarding full 20-year career with the Air Force, and then an equally exciting career as a detective with the Wayne County, North Carolina Sheriff's Office. In 2001, I embarked on an enviable travel career with the Department of Defense. In 2005, Shirley and I transferred to Germany where I oversaw the security of 45 commissaries, that's military grocery stores, in 10 different countries and 6 different time zones. Paul was successful at his chosen vacation, and so was I. Neither one of us knew disappointment in our professional endeavors. When I wasn't doing all that, I was very involved in church activities. From 1993 to 2001, I was a certified lay speaker for the United Methodist Church in North Carolina. I was a choir director and a handbell director for a church in North Carolina where we lived. In Virginia, I was a youth choir director. I wrote and arranged music. I played in four different worship teams. I taught guitar. I even produced with my wife, Shirley, two outdoor Christian concerts in Germany called Praise in the Park. Once again, all I knew was success. By all accounts, I was enjoying a very full life. My biggest life, my biggest love, other than Shirley, was my ability to make and play music, especially with my guitar, which I believed defined who I was. I loved my church life, and I could talk the talk with the best of them. Then, while living and working in Germany, reality hit. I didn't really realize it, but I was on my own road to Damascus. On July 21st, 2012, reality for me was an intoxicated driver driving a Mercedes-Benz C-Class sedan traveling at a speed of an estimated 80 to 120 miles an hour. His car hit mine, a Ford Focus, just forward of the driver's door. My car exploded, at least that's what it looked like, and I should have died. I arrived at the hospital in hemorrhagic shock and respiratory arrest. I suffered a total of 16 broken bones. My right leg was impaled on the gear shift selector, breaking both the tibia and fibula. Two fractures of my left femur, two fractures of my left humerus, broken left clavicle. My left shoulder was dislocated to where my backbone was. 10 broken ribs on my left side, a collapsed lung on the left side, and the right side soon joined, soon joined, and a broken sternum. The trauma room doctor who first treated me told me two years later when I met him that he had never seen anyone with the severity of my injuries survive an accident such as mine. When Shirley, who was in the States at the time of the accident, called the hospital, she was told that if she was coming, she had best come quickly it was very bad. They said I was in my last hour of life. That was Saturday night, and Shirley did not get there until Monday morning. What she did do while waiting to fly was get on the internet and on my Facebook page and put the word out that I had been involved in a serious accident and asked for prayer. I can tell you this, I do believe in the power of prayer. 
between my Facebook friends, friends of my Facebook friends, family, etc., Shirley and I have come to realize there was probably over a million people praying for us at the time. I can't wait to get to heaven and thank them. I was in a medically induced coma for 45 days, but Jesus was with me. Now, I don't recall the accident. When I first woke up in September, my first thought was, man, I must have really been tired last night because I don't remember going to bed. When I woke up, I had already undergone eight surgeries, received 130 units of blood, and was in my third hospital. That means my blood supply was changed out over eight times. I couldn't move my legs or my left arm. A nurse who was sitting next to me on my bed in the ICU told me I'd been in a severe traffic accident in Germany, but no one was killed. So imagine my surprise when I said, where am I? And, and the nurse said, I was at Walter Reed Hospital in Maryland. The night before, I was in Germany, as far as I knew. So I asked what day it was, and he said, well, what day do you think it is? And I said, I don't know, I'll bite. I, I knew it wasn't that day, but I said, how's, how's July 22nd sound? He said, try July, September 5th. Yikes. So the next day, my road to recovery began. Since then, I've had four more surgeries, one to insert a rod into my right tibia, while another doctor worked to free up my left shoulder. I had bone growing from the shoulder that was keeping me from being able to move my arm. I had one to replace the rod in my left femur and to remove bone that was growing into my thigh muscle. Then surgery to repair a complication uh, from that surgery. And, and a side note, well off the side, the complication is known as a seroma. So imagine if you will, a, uh, or the, what a seroma is, is when the blood and water try to be absorbed in your body, but it can't, so it's looking for a way to get out. So imagine a tire with the air bubble on the side of it. Well, one day that air bubble is going to burst and you've got problems, okay? It, it leads to severe, severe infections. And since I'd already dealt with severe infections, I could not afford another one. So the doctor, he took a look at it and he lanced it right there. And what was really interesting was when he lanced it, I want you to imagine a pencil, the water the size of a pencil coming out of my leg and shooting straight out. It made me think of the, when Jesus was on the cross and the soldier stabbed him with a spear and blood and water came gushing out. Well, that's what my leg looked like. So I got back up to the operating room again, and they had to repair that. Then due to radial nerve palsy in my left hand, I had tendon transfer to give me some, some functionality back to my hand. And through it all, Jesus was with me. The surgeries to install the rod in my right leg and replace the rod in my left leg, that made it possible for me to walk. So on January 14th, after that surgery, I was able to walk for the first time since July 21st. Now I've had to battle infections, blood clots in my legs, left arm and chest, swelling, or that's called edema, in both my legs and left arm and hand, and if that wasn't enough, I had an allergic reaction to a medicine to alleviate restless leg syndrome, which landed me back in the hospital because I became unresponsive, and while in the hospital, I stopped breathing. That in itself is a whole other story. But the bottom line is this. The nurses and the doctors said I was not responding to any stimulus, but from my perspective, I was. I was doing everything they asked me to do, and I can still feel to this day a, a tear from Shirley, from Shirley when she put her face next to mine and she said, Dishy, don't do this to me. So I believed in my heart at the time that I was dying. In fact, as I was laying there, things started going gray. I, I told myself, I said, you're dying. So this is what it's like to die. And folks, let me tell you something. It wasn't bad. Then the next thing I knew, the lights went out, and I heard Shirley from what seemed to be 100 miles away going, you stop breathing. And then the next thing I knew was actually a few minutes later, but what I, the next thing I knew was my chest is on fire because a nurse is doing a sternum rub, and they're bagging me. That hurt because I still had a broken sternum. But still, Jesus was with me. 
Then came the painful rehab. I was finally able to go home after five medical facilities, 180 days of five different medical facilities. So remember when I started this testimony, I called it my road to Damascus. I also said I was really good at talking the talk. I don't remember anything about my stays at the two hospitals in Germany. My first memory is waking up at Walter Reed. And even though I remember waking up at Walter Reed, I don't remember most of the people who came to see me while I was there. I do, however, remember a visit from my former pastor from a church we attended in Virginia Beach in Virginia. Shirley and I were both on the praise team there, and while I was talking to my former pastor, and Fran Cooper is her name, I confessed to her something that God allowed me to really realize. While I was really good at talking the talk, I was terrible at walking that talk. So Fran and I, we prayed right then and right there. I have many challenges. One of my biggest challenges is trying to play my guitar. I have accepted that while I can play and I teach again, I will never be able to play to the level of ability that I used to play. But in spite of all that, music is still a vibrant part of who I am. You see, I play for an audience of one. I received a t-shirt one Christmas from my best friend and former guitar student that says, the music is not in the guitar. And Shirley, who has taken such great care of me, as far as I'm concerned, it really is the hero of my story, is very good about reminding me that this is only temporary. And you know what? It is. It's only temporary. If not in this life, then when I get to heaven, I am positive I will never remember the events of 2012. I've had two distinct pity parties so far. I know I'll have more. I'm ready for them because I know now what to do. I call on my Jesus. During the first one, God told me, I saved your life. That's your miracle. Now, you're either going to get better or you won't. However, I needed to remember that Noah built the ark. So, during the second pity party, God simply said, read Job. You want to put pain and suffering into his proper perspective? Read the book of Job. And I'll tell you right now, it's got a happy ending. I've been asked, if I ever ask God, why did this happen? And I have not. I know why it happened. Free will was why it happened. Alexander Saramnoff chose to drive drunk. He chose to drive fast. He chose to drive reckless. That's what happened. What I have asked God is, what now? What do you want me to do now? So I was reminded of something I used to tell people all the time. Quit crying about what you can't or don't have and start rejoicing in what you do. I have much, and that much I, I do know. I want to be clear here and tell you that I personally don't believe that God decided to cause this accident. I believe that God knew this accident was going to happen, and he could have prevented this from happening, but instead he chose to allow it to happen and use the outcome for his glory, and I'm okay with that. You know, I was really struggling what to put into words about what I've really learned about all this. And something that Jesus said in John chapter 9 spoke to me and brought clarity to my situation. In John 9, 3, the second part of that verse, Jesus says, but this happened so that, my favorite two words, cause and effect, so that the work of God might be displayed in his life, or in this case, my life. The commentary from my Bible says, if God took suffering away whenever we asked, we would follow him for comfort and convenience and not out of love and devotion. Once I woke up and realized my situation, I had a no kidding opportunity to evaluate my life. Surprisingly, my first attitude was gratitude. I was alive. The support I received from Shirley and from so many others was very uplifting. And as I laid there in my hospital bed, Unable to move, I thought a lot about my life and how I was great at talking the talk, but terrible at walking that talk. Hence my realization that this was my personal road to Damascus. Dr. Charles Stanley spoke recently in a radio address. He said, the incident on the road to Damascus destroyed Paul's pride. He suffered defeat, humiliation, pain, and embarrassment, which turned out to be the beginning of the best days of his life. And so it was with me. I experienced all those things after my accident and during my initial recovery. 
Jesus redeemed Paul after that experience. I know he still faced consequences of, of this experience, and I do too. And just listen to what, what he wrote in 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 12, verse 9, after he asked for relief. Remember that? Take this thorn from my side. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, we don't know for sure what Paul's particular thorn in his flesh was. Some speculate he had poor vision because of the scales in his eyes. But in spite of whatever affliction he suffered, he found his purpose. And in spite of my challenges, well, that's why I do this. I want God to be glorified through me. I don't know why God spared me and so many others aren't given this miracle. And that's not for me to say. What is for me to say is that God is a God of miracles. And I'm standing here before you as proof. There are many things I can no longer do, but I can, however, give praise to my God. One of the first songs I heard while I was still in the hospital was Blessed Be Your Name by Matt Redman. And that song often inspired, or actually that song inspired, but I often tell the Father. I will praise you in victory. I will praise you in defeat. I also believe that Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, prays for us. According to the book of Hebrews, he not only knows what it is to suffer as a man, and he, even now, is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. The thought that Jesus cares enough to give himself in prayer on our behalf is humbling. Shirley confessed early on when she was first with me at the hospital that I was so broken and the doctors weren't even sure I would survive the next couple of days. Well, she prays to God, if he's going to die, go ahead, let him die. See, I was so broken and I was in pain. And even though I was in a coma, I was still feeling that pain. It was obvious. She loved me that much. And she cared that much. She did not want to see me suffer. I see this as an act of love. And it was also in keeping with my living will. That if ever things got that bad, to go ahead and let me go. Well, I also know that Jesus was praying too. And for once, I really am glad that God said no to Shirley's prayer and said yes to Jesus. The point that I'm trying to make is that he knows what's best for us according to his plan. Since my accident, I have had situations where I hit the point and I'm just too weak and too human to handle it myself. I know that Jesus will see me through it. Because he said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And if that's not enough, how about, and surely I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. That's pretty reassuring if you ask me. Just as God got the Apostle Paul's attention on the road to Damascus, God got my attention. Paul had many, many challenges after his encounter with Jesus on the road. And I believe at the end of the day, Paul would tell you that it's worth it all. And I, I want to believe, and I do believe, that at the end of the day, when this, my life is over with, I can look at Jesus and say, it was worth it. I have pain. I have pain every day. And what's, what's really cool is, the occasional headache, that, that allows me to focus on other parts of my body rather than my arm, my shoulder, my chest, my legs. But when, in the end, like I said, when my life is over, I can gladly say this was worth it. One last note about my pain. In 2014, Don Piper, he was the author of 90 Minutes in Heaven. It came out the 10th anniversary edition of the book and a movie edition of the book. And I read that book while I was in the hospital. A friend of mine sent it to me. And I wrote him a letter. And in the 10th anniversary edition of the book and in the movie edition of the book, he included my letter, which closed with this. Through your book, I felt God reassure me and remind me that no matter how bad my pain it is, it was nothing compared to his son's agony for me. My life is better since and because of that accident. And thanks to the fact that Jesus died to forgive my sins, I was able to almost immediately forgive Mr. Saramnoff for causing the accident that changed my life forever. I have heard it said, and I believe with my whole heart, that you don't forgive a person who has wronged you for their benefit. No, you forgive them for your benefit. And I have forgiven Mr. Saramnoff. 
I hope one day I can tell him that face to face. So my challenge to you is this. Don't wait for tragedy to call out to Jesus and rely on him to be there. Just do it. And do it today. I told Shirley that you would think that God would find a, a gentler way to get my attention. She said maybe he tried. Maybe he tried, had to hit you over the head. Or use a Mercedes Benz. So I leave you with this verse that I believe ties in well with the verse in Jeremiah that I opened with. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Now remember that. People say, well, God works good in all things. Then they stop. There's a catch. There is. For those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So do you love him? What would you say if Jesus asked you, do you love me? I hope so. And if you do, well, what is God calling you to do? God bless your socks off. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. And please give thanks to everything. We pray for everyone that is in need in our community, in our church, and around the world for blessings and healing and able to do things that they would like to. And in your name, we would like to uh, say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the glory, and the power, forever and ever. Amen. And responding to with our gifts to God, our, to God with our gifts, we have a way that you can do it electronically. It's, you just go to www.sharonumchurch.org and you can get into that or you can mail it to Sharon UM Church, P.O. Box 543, Manchester, Michigan, 48158. Today we've been seeing different things and hearing different things of stories. We all praise everyone that's been in these stories. And we hope they're uplifting to us, yet very touching. We hope that you will have something touching for somebody this week, or somebody can touch you this week in a certain way. You never know when it might happen. And all those people say, Amen.